Hi, everybody. This is Corey Hill from the Partnership for People with Disabilities at Virginia Commonwealth University. I'd like to welcome all of you to our November Talks on Tuesday, The Decision Tree, a tool for teaming and family engagement. This is part one of a two-part series. And in just a minute, I'm going to let the presenters introduce themselves. But we are trying to gather a little bit of information. So if you will please type in chat how many people are participating in the room with you to um, join our webinar? If you can just put a number in chat, we would really appreciate that. Thanks. Lots of people typing, thank you. Okay, thank you for doing that for us. That's very helpful. Um, I'm going to be turning it over to today's presenters, Kyla, Kyla Patterson and Lisa Terry, who will introduce themselves. Kyla and Lisa. Thanks, Corey. Hi, everybody. I'm Kyla Patterson. I'm the Early Intervention Team Leader at the State Office, the Infant and Toddler Connection of Virginia State Office. Hi everyone, I'm Lisa Terry and I am the Early Intervention Professional Development Consultant with BCU with the Partnership for People with Disabilities. So thank you for joining us today. So welcome to today's webinar. This is um, part one of a two-part series on using the decision tree to support family engagement and team decision making. Um, today we're going to kind of consider how the decision tree can support a consistent thinking, discussion, and decision-making process uh, for comparing a child functioning in the three outcome areas to that of same-age peers. So we'll talk about teaming and family engagement in that process, and we'll hear about one local system's use of the decision tree to improve their team assessment and child outcome summary processes. Part two of the series in December will include um, some scenario-based practice with the decision tree and discussion around common questions associated with its use. If you have any questions as we go along today, please feel free to type those in chat. Uh, we'll address as many as we can today, but there may be some that we save for a more thorough discussion during the December webinar. So to get started, I'm curious to know how many of you have already had a chance to watch the Decision Tree tutorial? So if you can raise your hand if you have already watched it, that'll just give me a little bit of an idea about how many of you have done that. Lots of hands going up. That's great. Okay. So it looks like at least about, you know, maybe half of you have, and some more folks are typing yes in chat. So great. Um, if you haven't um, had a chance to watch it yet, I do encourage you to do that. Um, it's really designed to be a quick reference, kind of an overview of the decision tree and how it's used. We're hoping that it's going to be a helpful resource for new service coordinators and providers as they come into our system, um, as well as for current practitioners who want um, a quick review. So we are going to talk today about Virginia's requirement to use the decision tree, um, as well as to engage families in using that tool with the rest of the team. And I'd like to do kind of a a check-in, a pulse check um, as we get started, just to see how people are feeling about this right now. So how are you feeling about using the decision tree? I'm going to ask you to, to drop your pointer to indicate whether you're kind of at the yikes, I'm not sure this is a good idea, maybe you're kind of okay, I feel okay about it, or yay, I love the idea of engaging families in this discussion. And as a quick reminder, you can get your pointer tool by looking at the vertical toolbar over um, on the left side of your screen. If you click in the second box with the sunburst, you can then click on one of the, the icons and then click in the 
spot on the screen that indicates how you're feeling about the decision tree. Great. A few more still popping up. It looks like we've kind of got a range, which is, is exactly what I would expect at this point since it's a relatively new thing we're talking about. But I'm happy to see most people are, um, you know, kind of in the okay area. Um, but we hope that through um, using the tutorial, um, today's webinar, December's webinar, having some time to actually um, practice with it and use it um, in team discussions that will kind of move everybody um, to the right hand side. But I appreciate you sharing with me um, how you're feeling about it as we get started. So we know that determining outcome rating involves three things. Um, first, understanding a child's functioning in a given child outcome area. Secondly, understanding typical development so you know how you would expect a child that age to be functioning in that outcome area. And then third, making a comparison to decide how close this child's functioning is to the functioning expected for the child's chronological age. And that process of comparing a child's functioning to that of same age peers to reach an outcome rating really is a thinking and a discussion process. And the decision tree is the tool we use to support consistency in that thinking and discussion process. And I think it's important to know that it's not just how we think about it in Virginia. If you look at national resources, um, like there's a relatively new age anchoring guidance document that was developed by the Early Childhood Technical Assistance Center. In that document, they note that the team's discussion is best guided by the use of the decision tree. So this is a national um, kind of process, not just something we're doing in Virginia. There are certainly lots of different versions of the decision tree out there, but the concept is universal. So in Virginia, we have long recommended use of the decision tree to assist in determining child outcome ratings. Um, and then in more recent years, um, as we've kind of focused on data quality and ensuring a consistent and accurate um, rating, we really have been more purposeful in thinking about how the decision tree supports those goals. So I'd like to hear from you again about how often you are using the decision tree when deciding the child outcome rating right now. Um, and again, this is a drop your pointer in the appropriate um, circle. And this is anonymous, to be honest. We're just trying to kind of get a picture of where we are. Um, and again, remember you can get that pointer tool in the vertical toolbar um, by clicking on that sunburst, the second one down. Okay, great. Thanks for your participation. So obviously the majority of folks are saying that they are always or mostly using the decision tree and that's great to see. Um, that gives us a great jumping off spot for our conversation today and for our work moving forward. I thought you might be interested in seeing how providers responded last year in 2017 when we asked this same question on the provider implementation survey. So at that point, you could see that um, just over half were saying that they always or mostly used it. And 22% rarely or never. And I see Karen Taylor's asking if I mean actually looking at the decision tree or using the knowledge of how it works. And I'm fine with however folks answered that question. Um, we certainly recognize that there's some of both going on. Um, and like I said, in, in whichever category you fall in terms of whether you're actually looking at it or you're thinking about it, um, in either case that gives us a good spot to work from as we go forward. Yeah. 
The other piece of information that I think is kind of interesting is, um, so knowing that 56% of those who responded to the provider implementation survey last year said they always or mostly used it, and of this group today, a, a, a much bigger percentage actually of that um, were in that always or mostly category. Um, we could look at some data that we have about whether people think using the decision tree results in more accurate ratings. So in that same 2017 provider implementation survey that we just talked about, 63% mostly or strongly agreed that it does result in more accurate ratings, and only 6% only disagreed, right? But remember, we saw 22% said they rarely or never used it. So I think we can see some shift in um, people recognizing its value and beginning to use it more. Um, the other day that we had, we, we did the MISER pilot um, uh, earlier this year, and um, for those of you who don't know, the MISER is an assessment tool, and we had 13 local systems who were willing to try using that tool as part of their um, assessment and child outcome summary process. Um, and those who were doing the pilot were required to use the decision tree as well. Um, and really at the end of that pilot, the participants felt that using the decision tree was the element that had the biggest impact on their inter-rater reliability. So based on that kind of data and based on national technical assistance that reinforces the importance of using a tool like the decision tree, and based on Virginia's focus on ensuring high quality child outcome data, Virginia is now requiring the use of the decision tree at entry, annual, and at exit. So the big thing we want to do today, or one of the things we want to do today, is talk about what that requirement really means. So how many of you have seen this version of the decision tree? Raise your hand if you have seen this version. And you can raise your hand by clicking on that hand icon that's right under your name at the top of the participant box. Wow, lots and lots of hands going up. I'm up to at least 43 of you um, are raising your hand that you've seen um, this version of the decision tree. So that's great. We are requiring use of this particular version of the decision tree. Um, it was released in September, and each local system manager received a number of laminated copies during our um, statewide meeting of local system managers. Um, I wanted to make sure you knew that you could also make just regular copies. Um, there are links posted on both the Virginia Early Intervention Professional Development website and the Infant and Toddler Connection of Virginia website. Um, so that way you can give copies to families, other folks in your um, system who may not need a laminated copy. So I wanted to point out several really intentional choices that we made in the design of this version. So I'm gonna grab my pointer tool and first draw your attention up here, which is um, a spot where we have a reminder that all of the discussions and decisions that follow as you move down the decision tree need to be based on all assessment information, right? So that's just a, a, a quick reminder. This is not based on items on an assessment tool. This is based on all of the information you have about the child's functioning. There's also a note here under the top question um, that performance of an age-expected skill that emerges at a younger age is not sufficient to answer yes to the question about whether the child ever functions in ways that would be considered age expected. So for example, smiling at a caregiver would not be considered age expected functioning for a 10 month old. You'll notice that under each question, or each decision point that you're at in the decision tree, um, there's a box that says, let's think of some examples. And that's really there to help ensure that we are making thoughtful decisions based on the child's actual functioning and that we have evidence to support our ratings. Um, you might notice the colors. We have moved away from any combination of red, yellow, and green 
um, just to be sure we avoid any kind of unintended connotation or comparison to a stoplight. And so we've opted for early intervention, purple and teal instead. And then finally, we have um, the summary statement at the bottom. And these summarize the child's functioning compared to same age peers, and they correspond to what you're going to write in that team narrative section on the IFSP. Um, I do want to point out, I'm sure you, many of you have already noticed, that the statements are numbered. Um, and that numbering is really there just to help make the flow from the decision after the first question, right up here, to make that easy to describe with a short phrase here in the box. So we can say consider statements one through three instead of some other longer description of how you're going to proceed. So those of you who enter data into ICOT, um, you know that the statement numbers are the same as the rating numbers that you enter in our data system. But are you going to talk about numbers or the rating number during your team discussion with the decision tree? No, you're not. Again, the numbering of these statements here is just for the purpose of directing the flow down the decision tree. They're not there to represent the rating numbers that are purely for data entry. I'm going to take just a minute and kind of branch off of our tree um, and answer a question that we hear a lot when we do talk about the decision tree. Um, which is where did Virginia get the rating or summary statements that we use on our IFSP and on the bottom of the decision tree? Um, those of you who have been around Virginia Part C for a while um, might remember that nationally the first um, iteration of the statements that corresponded to the one through seven child outcome ratings were really jargony um, and I thought kind of confusing for professionals um, as well. So they had wording like near somewhat or near emerging. And when Virginia decided to integrate the three child outcomes into the team assessment narrative on our IFSP, the stakeholder group who worked with the state office on that effort worked to develop um, a bit more family-friendly language for those statements. Um, and again, if you were to look at some um, guidance documents on national websites um, like the Early Childhood Technical Assistance Center, you will see that nationally folks have moved to descriptors that are more like those you see here. Okay, so getting back to the decision tree. So on the reverse side of the new decision tree that we were just looking at, there is um, some information for families. Uh, to support their engagement in the child outcome summary process. So here we explain why we measure the child outcomes, what each of the outcomes includes, and how the family is involved in this process. So we're requiring everyone to use this version of the decision tree to number one, support cons a, a consistent process statewide, but also to support family engagement in that process. And we'll talk more about that family engagement component in a minute. The next thing to know about the required use of the decision tree is that the decision tree must be on the table and available for all team members to see. So that could be a paper version, which could be one that sits in the middle of the table, but everybody can reference it, or you could give a copy to every team member you could have it on your computer screen as long as everybody could see it. Or we recently heard from one local system that decided to have it enlarged to poster size and they've posted it on the wall of their assessment room. So that's a great idea too. There are a number of ways to accomplish this, but the purpose is that everybody is able to see this um, document as you're having this discussion and making decisions. So why would it be important? to have a copy on the table, so to speak. Um, use your chat and kind of share your thoughts about that. So if you already do it, you already have a copy um, for folks to, to reference, tell us why you do it. Um, and if you don't do it yet, think about why it would be a good idea. And like I said, please share your thoughts in chat. Yes, Patty's saying as a visual reminder, it helps the family to be included. 
family's part of the team, the decision-making process, it should be able to follow along and be familiar with what we're using for that discussion. It helps family members to be more involved in the decision-making process. Oh, I like so that everyone is using the same language, the same process. Uh, it could be a more streamlined way of getting to a unified understanding of where the child is, right? That's a great thought as well. Everyone can follow the flow of the decision. It can help reach a consensus. Uh, Robin's pointing out it can help the family understand what's being discussed. Puts everybody on the same level with information and process. Yep, make sure everybody's on the same page. Families think about their child in functioning as a starting point, right? So that certainly aligns with um, uh, our, our vision, our mission, our key principles in early intervention, and it helps reinforce that from the beginning. I think that's a great point. Uh, and so we have a question, this is now to replace the child outcome cards that have been used in the past with families. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you could certainly still use those, but I think they'd be a bit redundant with the information that's on the decision tree. Um, and it does just really build on that use of, of the, the outcome cards um, to um, have the visual of the whole process and the decision making um, that happens to get to those outcome statements. Um, and helps everyone relate to each other. Great, yeah, those are all, all great things. I think it's about transparency um, uh, with families, um, consistency, including everyone, all working from the same framework. Folks talked about that. I think also from the provider perspective, it helps prevent drift, just like we talk about using an assessment tool as an age anchor. We all know that we're susceptible over time to um, a, a bit of drift in thinking about what might be typical at a given age level. In that same way, we might be susceptible to a bit of drift about where things fall out on this decision tree. Um, and having it there as that visual reminder for us as professionals, um, I think is important too. So as I mentioned earlier, we do expect that families will be supported to be fully engaged in using the decision tree in the child outcome summary process. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about that now. But I wonder, as we get started, um, what are some ways that you're already supporting family involvement in this process? And again, if you'll use the chat to share your thoughts. And Guchlin Powhatan, I see your question about what do I mean by drift? Did I answer that by the time I was done talking or not? If not, just type that in again and I'll make sure I come back to that. Okay, so thinking about some ways that folks are already supporting families um, to participate in the child outcome summary process, we have, um, oh, somebody who's reviewing the decision tree as part of intake. What a great um, opportunity to introduce that concept and begin to prepare families for their participation. Um, how we ask questions during the assessment for service uh, planning process, right? You're already supporting getting their input and their reflections on their child's functioning. Um, similar, Jen is saying, have them share examples of skills the child is doing, right? Uh, team members might be asking families to confirm the accuracy of narratives that are read and ask for corrections or additional input. So um, checking with families about, um, about your perceptions or what you're seeing um, that child's functioning to be and, and checking to see that that matches with what families are seeing. Provide all IFS teams team members with a visual copy of the decision tree and ask reflective questions. Great, so that's some folks already using a copy of the decision tree. Uh, asking specific questions about what um, they're doing or able to do, what the child's doing or able to do from the family's perspective. Yes, and um, Karen also suggesting that clarification piece 
um, including families in all aspects of the assessment, um, explaining outcome statements prior to the assessment. Yep, and then moving on to develop outcomes with family preferences and needs in their daily activities. Um, right, so this assessment process, this really transparent conversation with families ensures that they have the complete information they need to then make those critical decisions about what are their family priorities, what are the outcomes they'd like to see um, for their child and family. Uh, thinking about roles, I, Norfolk is um, talking about um, thinking about roles in that discussion process, and, and in their case, the service coordinator is, um, sounds like maybe it's that main support um, in reviewing the decision tree and explaining some of that information to families. Sharing age-appropriate expectations with families during intake. Yeah, so I see a lot of comments here. Let me check this last one here. Yeah, just that open discussion about how everybody's seeing that child in terms of functioning. Um, yeah, and it aligns, as, as this last comment is pointing out, this is what is going in um, the IFSP narrative, right? So it makes sense that you're having that conversation with the family. Um, it's not like you're not going to share that information in the narrative um, as well. So great. Thank you for adding your comments and suggestions. So we really do, I mean, obviously we all see families as equal team members, so it really is only appropriate and respectful that they're included in the process of that team discussion and decisions about their child's functioning in the three child outcome areas, and that they can see the decision tree that we're using to make that decision. Um, and we certainly know that this is going to be a change for a number of assessment teams and that engaging families in this process um, it might be more challenging and or more uncomfortable in some situations than others. But really, if we can remind ourselves that one of the purposes of early intervention, as we've stated in Chapter 1 of the Practice Manual, is to enable families to provide care for their children. And one of the family outcomes that we measure is the extent to which early intervention helps families effectively communicate their needs, their children's needs. And with those things in mind, I think it, it helps remind us that working through kind of the initial learning curve and maybe some of our own discomfort to fully engage families in using the decision tree with us is a really important and worthwhile effort that aligns with what we say we do in early intervention and how we support families. So from a practical standpoint, we really expect that the service coordinator and the service provider team members are going to support family engagement in this process by doing um, three kind of things. Um, first, that they're explaining the basic information about why we focus on the three child outcome areas, how the decision tree is used, and how the rating statement information is used. And a number of folks just commented that those are things they're already doing, that preparation and explanation with families. And that's the first step in supporting their engagement. Um, the second would be encouraging families to share information about their child's functioning in each of the outcome areas. Again, we certainly saw that in a number of comments in chat. And then the third is really encouraging family participation in the team discussion at each of those questions and decision points um, in the decision tree. And remember that the information on the back side of the decision tree really is designed to help, especially with that explanation and preparation step. And I'll also just mention one thing here specifically about exit ratings. So we know that exit ratings aren't always determined during a formal kind of team meeting of the full IFSP team, like it is at annuals or at, at, at um, initial IFSP. But we do expect that those who are determining the ratings at exit will still refer to a copy of the decision tree and that they'll engage families in that process of using the decision tree at exit whenever possible. 
And then finally, I just want to make clear that there is no required documentation associated with the required use of the decision tree. So you don't need to talk about it in a contact note. You don't need to write on the decision tree or keep a copy in the child's record. Okay. So are there any questions about the requirements before I turn it over to Lisa to talk more about implementing the new requirements? And you can just type your questions in chat if you have one right now. I don't see, it doesn't look like anybody's typing at the moment, so um, we'll move on and there'll be some more time for questions um, at the end. But at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Lisa. Thank you, Kyla. So as we are really aligning this process across the state, I just want to have like a real honest conversation because change, it really is hard for us. And throughout my time in early intervention as a service coordinator, as an educator, as a supervisor, I just saw several things happen when it came to the child outcome summary. So raise your hand if this may look familiar to you. So you're going to use your raise your hand feature by your name in the participant box. So click the hand icon if you've ever seen people maybe use their hands to show other team members what number they're thinking for that child or maybe they kind of hid their hands behind their back so the families didn't see, or maybe they just kind of like gave each other a look and they could have mouthed the number, or maybe they kind of pointed to the number on the outcome statement. So I see some hands going up. And that was really something in my observations that I saw, that most families, they weren't really involved in the discussion. Rather, it was really just the providers and the service coordinators who kind of looked at each other and decided the statement that really best fit the child. And from someone that was just kind of observing the assessment, it was pretty awkward watching for everyone involved, and I'm sure the family felt that way too. So let's think about when a parent takes their child to the doctor. So this mother, Sarah, she's discussing her concerns with the doctor about her daughter, Charlie, and the doctor immediately starts to look at Charlie. Sarah just figures this is all standard procedure. In her mind, she's thinking, why is he doing that? What does that mean? And she secretly worries, kind of analyzing each of the doctor's movements. Sarah sues Charlie when she's upset, and she's feeling a little upset herself throughout the whole process. So the doctor prescribes Charlie with an antibiotic for an ear infection, providing little discussion and feedback from the mother. So Sarah's a little concerned because this is Charlie's fifth ear infection this year, but she just goes home and she starts the antibiotics. So Sarah was feeling really unsure when to speak up. She did not understand what was really going on. She was merely just present in the moment. So type in the chat, how do you think this situation relates to parents during the child outcome summary process? I see a couple people typing. They're feeling, they feel disconnected from the conversation, yes, because they might not really understand what's going on. They're not sure what to say. They aren't the expert. Yes, I think we hear that all the time. But most of our parents are feeling overwhelmed by the cost process, even using the new decision tree and the information sheet. And, and we can read their kind of cues of when they're overwhelmed and maybe, you know, they do need a break and they need a spot. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in the tip. And one person collecting the information and making the decision without much input from the parent. Absolutely. And so the parent does have information that they want, they may be able to share, especially when we're talking about different like routines and settings and activities that we're trying to 
uh, correlate with the child. And it's familiar and routine for us, but not for the family. Exactly. I think sometimes, like, it was always hard for me to remember um, that, you know, you just kind of get so stuck in your routine because you do this all the time and that you kind of have to take a step back and remember this is the family's first time going through this. And so they need a little bit more of an explanation. And let's see, the exam is done to her, not with her. Exactly. And I know I have a million kids for those that know me, but I, I remember every time my kids needed to take their shots, I always felt like a little bit better when the doctor kind of included me or the nurse included me and allowed me to kind of hold them and comfort them at the same time that it had to happen. And so sometimes it's just those conversations that can mean the world to the parents. Um, it's demeaning. Yes, they're looking for us for answers. And if we don't solicit the input from them, they may not get involved. Absolutely. And they might just and that's kind of, you know, the parent's personality sometimes. They might just take the back seat. Um, some parents are definitely more vocal. I think that we know that. But there are parents that are always as vocal, and they kind of need uh, a little bit more from us in order to um, get involved. Not involved in the decision, not really sure what to ask. Right. So, like, this mother in this situation, Sarah, she didn't know if it would be important that her child had all these ear infections. And as we know that sometimes the doctors don't always look at the complete medical history to see that. And she wasn't sure that it would be important. As we all know, something like that is very important. Uh, she may feel intimidated to ask questions. Absolutely. Um, we start out with the parents' opinion and some aren't really sure how they feel about it. But I think they feel a part of it. We're in a pilot in North Carolina. Okay. Yeah, so the parents' opinion and just making sure that they feel like they're involved and they're informed and they're part of the team is really important. And I feel like, you know, sometimes, have you ever been at the doctor's office where maybe the nurse and the doctor kind of give each other a look and you're like, you know, you think there's something wrong or they're probably not telling me something. And you might think that but not verbally always say it out loud. But this is real life and this is something um, important for the family. So this past year, I participated in the Miser pilot and implemented the use of decision tree with some of our team. And prior to that, few providers may have used the decision tree. Most providers use the laminated child outcome summary card that somebody referenced earlier. And there were so many providers in this local system that much like the telephone game, everyone learned how to implement the child outcome summary process differently. And it showed. Uh, little consistency across the board because everybody was kind of doing it different and there was a little bit of the awkwardness sometimes when you got to that conversation. And it often really left families out of it. Um, and so families weren't always included. They were there and they were present, but they weren't always included and engaged in the conversation. And of course, there was some hesitation because change was hard for anyone. So, Early interventionists, they began to see the decision tree as a tool to enhance family engagement um, in teaming. And this is what they had to say. So Josetta Tomei said, the decision tree is a wonderful tool to visually and verbally involve parents in the child outcome summary process for each indicator area. Parental involvement is key to be true to the family-centered approach, and the decision tree allowed us to stay true to this model. And Catherine Verschelde said, I loved the decision tree because it included the parents and gave them a better understanding of the state indicators. It also allowed them to understand their child's strengths and areas in which early intervention will help using the family-centered approach to meet their child's milestones. But just remember, it takes time and it takes opportunities to kind of find your own groove implementing the decision tree into practice. So someone commented in the chat that parents are trying to understand a lot of information in a short period of time with ASP, and then there's a quick shift to the cost. So most families, they're willing to go along, but they also feel the pressure. And is that the right answer? Did I pick the right answer? You're right. Um, in a lot of families, we're going to kind of go through this in the test, but they do feel the pressure. And I think sometimes, like, we help build that pressure because we're feeling pressure within ourselves. Like, we're feeling the time pressure, and we're feeling like, we need to hurry and we need to get this done. So let's go through some of the key tips now um, and kind of think about maybe some tips that you're already using and some others that might be beneficial to kind of help alleviate some of that pressure during uh, this time. So pull out your handout, and thank you, Jeannie, for posting it in the chat box. 
And if you don't have that in front of you, Jeannie posted a link to it there in the chat box that you can get. Um, and it's just some key tips that we're going to go through. So first we're going to start with prior to the meeting. So before the meeting, you want to prepare really just by familiarizing yourself with the decision tree, making sure that you feel comfortable with the flow of the decision tree and just the key talking points. And then you want to touch base with the team members to identify who's going to lead the discussion. And I think that this is a really important piece of it, too, because you can get into the assessment and it's time to have that conversation with the family and nobody really knows who's going to kind of take the lead, especially if it's like a team that you're not familiar with or you don't work with all the time. Um, but this can be a service coordinator who facilitates it or a provider. It's just important to remember that everyone on the team has valuable input in that discussion and the facilitator is really going to help guide our process through it. And again, if you have a team that you're not familiar with, then just make sure you kind of touch base with it who might lead that discussion beforehand. And then you can discuss at a team meeting maybe to help you feel confident during implementation. So this could be like your staff meetings or your regular team meetings. And this is really just your time to kind of talk about how you're utilizing the decision tree among um, colleagues and supervisors in case you have like any kind of questions about the decision tree. Um, and this will really just help you feel a little bit more confident. And finally, skill building helps you practice. So grab a partner and role play. Practice different scenarios. So for example, if the decision tree, if it indicates a statement might be on the lower end, like Kyla said, we might not always feel comfortable having those kind of discussions. And although we might not feel comfortable having that conversation, practicing it, it kind of helps you feel a little bit more confident in the way that you're delivering that message and you're having that discussion with the family. And at the end of the day, we really do work in early intervention, and so it's kind of our job to have those uncomfortable conversations with families just to provide them enough information so they can make um, their own informed decisions. And I have to tell you, skill building is something that I use frequently um, when I would train new service coordinators and educators. And they definitely felt very uncomfortable doing it at first um, because it is an uncomfortable process when you're practicing something new. Um, but they found their own groove and they started to feel a lot more confident in just having those conversations with families. So next we're gonna go to during. So during the meeting, observe the caregivers too. So I think this is really important because we may all interpret things differently, and so this is an important role for all of us on the team at um, every moment, just to read the caregiver's cues, their nonverbal cues, and in case we need to pause, maybe allow them time to ask questions, um, or just to kind of give them some feedback, or give us some feedback on discussing any uh, specific examples. And you can also provide a break or a change of scenery if needed, I know sometimes our assessments can be in the same room all the time and the child might be a little bit um, fussy or tired after being in that same spot for an hour. And so maybe just suggesting a slight change of scenery might help. Um, you can also um, just make sure that, you know, if it's too much and you're kind of reading the family cues and that maybe they need a break, then maybe you know, if your system's able to, then come back, you know, tomorrow if you feel like it's overwhelming to the family and it's too much for them to finish the process. Um, and this will really help the parents kind of refocus and participate. Next, you want to be ready to contribute examples as a team member. So just being prepared to discuss, like, your perspective and your feedback that you also want to give as, as the parents contributing and you're contributing um, as you move down the flow chart just from your perspective, because uh, we all really do have a different lens on, and I think it's important for us to value each other's uh, different perspectives and hearing what each member has to say. So after the meeting, you want to touch base with your team on what went well and maybe what are the areas of growth. We can all improve as a team, um, and really the best way is to kind of just talk about it and say, you know, like, I feel like, you know, like it went really well with you facilitating this discussion. Um, I think that, you know, maybe I could have 
given a little bit more feedback or, you know, like if you needed more information from me, like feel free to ask me. And I've asked like some of the stronger assessment teams before, and this is really what they say has helped them become stronger. And it's just, you know, having that conversation afterwards of how they can improve and what were the strengths during that assessment. Um, and then you can revisit the discussion during a team member. So maybe you've been implementing the decision tree and then at your next staff meeting um, or your next team meeting that you can bring up maybe a scenario that kind of came up that you weren't comfortable with or you didn't feel comfortable with or you were unsure how to handle. Um, and then you can kind of get some feedback from your supervisor and your other colleagues just to help you brainstorm. So what we're going to do next is if there were any kind of tips that you would like to add that are additional tips as you, most of you have been implementing uh, that you found helpful, go ahead and type that into the chat box. So again, you're going to type in chat any additional tips you find helpful implementing the decision tree. So making sure the family's prepared for what to expect in the assessment. Absolutely. I think that's very important. And as we saw in the scenario, that maybe if that mother, Sarah, was a little bit more prepared of what to expect from the doctor, that maybe she would have gave a little bit more feedback in that manner. And so I am a big fan of making sure we're explaining everything and not assuming that the parent always knows. I see some more people typing. It's helpful for team members other than the service coordinator to lead this portion of the meeting. And I think, you know, for in this situation, every system kind of does things differently, so you really have to find what works well for your system and for your team. Find out from the parent either during or after how they felt about the process and their level of involvement. Absolutely. I think that's a very uh, key tip too is checking in with the parent. You know, like how are you feeling right now about the process? Does it sound right to you? Um, are you in agreement? I think that's a great, uh, a great thing to know from the parent. I use the child indicators booklet with the parent comparing child to the statements for the age. And so I think um, some of the process things, what I've heard people like typically do is maybe they're going to go over the three outcome areas of the narrative. And so if they're starting with positive social emotional skills, they're going to talk about that. And then they might kind of talk about what their child's doing and then maybe what's coming up for their child. Um, this is also sometimes when people might talk about the developmental ages and then they're going to move on to the decision tree to give a statement. So that's just another example too. Being prepared for the visit and highlighting strengths makes families feel more comfortable. Absolutely. Um, so that's just really about informing them to help them feel prepared and, you know, letting them know what's going to happen, what to expect, and then letting them know what their child's strengths are as well and what their family strengths are too. When recording child's level of functioning, give age levels to help. A child has some age appropriate skills to help cue team members for your thoughts. Yeah, and another way, like I used to cue people, um, especially like if it was like in a certain area that I knew that they could have valuable feedback. I mean, I would just ask them um, if I was facilitating that discussion. I would say, you know, like, um, do you have anything you want to add about what you've heard about a certain like scenario or situation? Make sure to set up at the very beginning that everyone will participate and be able to make it a team event. Let the parent weigh in first in each area. Explain that each parent will involve um, some speech language. Yeah, so you're going to talk about each area, and and I like that's what I really like about the back of the decision tree is because it's a good visual of what to expect when you're discussing each outcome area. There seems to be a lot of gray area on how to use the decision tree when you go left and right. Our staff are split. For example, if the child is 24 months old and their age level and social emotional are 20, 22, half of us would move to the left where the other half would move to the right. Can you give me some guidance? And so we're going to actually have some more specific um, examples or scenarios in the December 
But I think one of the key things when you're looking at the decision tree is you're going to um, kind of talk about what it is that you're expecting, like what kind of aspects you are looking for, and if it's looking at um, all the outcomes and across all settings and situations. So, for example, sometimes I might have a child um, that communicates really well. Um, they communicate well at home, but at childcare, they're not communicating all the time. And so that would really um, sway my decision on where we're going to follow it. And so just think about the whole question and kind of grasp that and individualize it to that child in that manner. Um, ask parents about other therapies that child may be receiving and inquiring activities they are doing. Yeah, and so you're, you are going to take all of that information during your uh, functional assessment to gather all of that information. And so before you even get to the decision tree, you'll have that information to discuss. And the decision tree is based on functional skills, not discrete age level, discrete skills. Yes. Um, it is all based on functional skills. Um, I know that some people, because the IFSC has the developmental ages on it, that is a point where some people choose to discuss it, and um, not all do. Some wait until they're signing papers. So it's just really, I think that's kind of a system decision that uh, you'll have to discuss with your local system manager on how you're implementing it and what works best for your system. Um, show interest in all areas of the child's development. Absolutely. So that was, there were some great tips. Um, and again, in the December, we are going to specifically talk about different scenarios and kind of give you some good firm examples on uh, moving down the decision tree flowchart. So I think December will really help too. Uh, just thought of this, maybe the decision tree can be introduced briefly at the beginning of the ASP encounter. The service coordinator could be the facilitator and inform that the decision tree will be used again at the end of the visit to summarize all that has been observed, discussed, and set the plan. Yes. Um, and I think, you know, exactly how somebody else was introducing it at the intake. That was a great way to show the family and kind of introduce it. I know some people start introducing uh, what the IFSP is even going to look like um, just by giving them a blank copy of it. So I think that you're going to find different tips and what works because the teams and systems across the state are very different. But what we're going to move into next is we're going to go ahead and um, start opening up the floor for questions. Just so you guys know, the evaluation survey that you're going to get, it's going to give you a place for you to submit questions or specific scenarios that maybe you would like to see um, addressed in the December webinar. And Jeannie linked that there. But Kyla and I are open for questions. So if you guys have any specific questions you would like to get answered, um, go ahead and start typing those in the chat box. And um, Tyla's also going to go over a couple other resources that she mentioned before. Yeah, and maybe I'll move through that as folks are thinking about and typing in their questions so we can maximize our time. Um, I did earlier um, reference the age anchoring guidance document that's available through ECTA. Um, if that's something you're interested in looking at, I wanted you to sort of see what it looked like. And Jeannie has given us a link there, that might be a resource you'd like to check out. Um, Terry, uh, Tara, I'm sorry, I combined your two names. Um, uh, is there a plan to translate the new tree into Spanish? Yes, there is, and our, our um, anticipated date for having that is um, November 19th. That's the target date at this point, and we'll certainly let you know as soon as that is available. Uh, Lisa's asking, you use the decision tree with the numbers on it with the parents. Um, so we use the decision tree that we showed today that has numbers for the statements, right? The statements are numbered, but remember we talked about the fact that those numbers are there just to direct you down the tree because of that, that early question or that early answer that says if you answer this, then you're going to go towards statements one through three. If you answer this, you're going to go through st to statements four through seven. That's the only purpose of the number being on the decision tree. So there's no need to talk to a family about numbers. Um, you're going to use the statement. Let me back up here. I think a question. Are there any videos of a service coordinator doing an actual annual IFSP review that we can learn from to actually watch a good example of someone doing it? 
Okay, so let me jump ahead a couple of slides and then I'll come back. Um, so between now and December, I was going to recommend that you maybe explore um, some information and videos that are available in the um, nationally developed Child Outcome Summary Team Collaboration Toolkit, and there's a link here. Um, and um, it does include, I don't remember if it specifically includes an annual as opposed to an initial IFSP, but it does have a number of videos of um, a team using the decision tree with the family. And so that may be something that you would like to take a look at. All right, Norfolk's saying they're still feeling like families are seeing a one through seven rating system. They don't have enough time to fully understand the cost process and to really wrap their heads around the idea that it's not a one through seven scale. You know, unless somebody had told the family there's a one through seven scale, I don't know why a family would necessarily read this decision tree as a one through seven scale. I wonder to some extent, you know, we know a bit more, and so I think we see it that way or worry about that. But I think the way that you talk to the family about the decision tree will determine how the family um, views it. Um, and, and in terms of having enough time to fully understand the process, I do think as we practice with this and we're using this, um, it'll be interesting to see how teams evolve in thinking about when do you introduce that? Is it at intake as some folks are doing? Where along the process are you starting to prepare the family? for this process. Um, and I think we'll, we'll find, as, as Lisa said, we'll kind of find, find our groove um, as, we, as we move along. And, and there were a couple of comments about worrying um, that it was overwhelming for families. And, you know, I think um, a lot of the upfront stuff at initial can be overwhelming um, for families. I'm not sure that layering the decision tree makes it any more overwhelming if we're integrating that or as we get good at integrating that with our discussion of the assessment information. Um, but it is, it's already a lot of information for families. Even families who may not say a lot or you may not feel like they're fully engaged um, in that conversation the first time around, I think we need to think about the really important message that we're giving families by giving them the opportunity to fully participate in that conversation. We are saying from the start that we value their um, input um, and their report of what they're seeing for their child, um, their um, input about what is important to them as a family for their child, um, and that we are going to be fully transparent, um, you know, with families. It sets the stage for coaching. Um, and natural learning environment practices, um, and, it, and it sets the stage for the kinds of outcomes that we want to see for families participating in early intervention. And I think what we'll find is those families who may have felt a bit overwhelmed and not been as involved in initial might be more involved at the annual because you'll be continuing to build that process that you established right from the very beginning. Oh, and Corey's soliciting folks who want to sign up to be videoed. Kyla, I put in I put in the chat box my email address. So if anyone did want to be videoed, and we're more than willing to come to you guys, um, because I know a lot of people would love to see videos as it's being used, especially with the newer version of this decision tree. So feel free to email me if you would love to get videoed um, and share some of that information. Great. And as we're at 12:59, I just want to do a quick reminder that our December part two um, uh, webinar is on December 4th. Again, it will focus on some scenarios and some uh, of these bigger discussion questions. We'll have a little a bit more opportunity for some practical conversation about that. Um, and again, if you haven't yet watched the um, decision tree tutorial, we'd really encourage you to do that before um, the December talks on Tuesday. I want to thank Kyla and Lisa for uh, sharing this information with us. Um, please do plan to join us on December 4th. Um, as was mentioned, you are already registered for this one, so you will get the connection information as we get closer to the date.
It looks like a few people are still typing some comments. Feel free to do that. Um, we will be saving the chat, and if there's something we've missed, we want to honor your 1 o'clock time, and so we will address those in December if need be. So I hope everybody has a nice afternoon, and we will see you in December. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.